I am one of the, I am one of the conveners of this um, thing that we call in the virtual heritage group. Uh, it is frankly an experiment. It began when we were thinking about the lockdown and the success of the AGM that was held during the lockdown uh, via Zoom when it enabled many people who wouldn't normally contribute to society meetings to take part. So we put together an experimental program uh, for five meetings and we'll see how it goes. And for that reason, I'd ask if you've got any feedback, we'd love to receive it, please. Uh, the principle of the first five meetings is a basically being done by committee members of the of the society because it's less embarrassing if the technicalities fail when committee members are talking uh, than it would be if we've got external speakers here. Um, so um, the first meeting uh, was a month ago today and I spoke there and if you're interested you can look at the video that's already on the website on the YouTube site and that is now publicly available. Um, the uh, number today is rather larger than the number that we had uh, where, when I gave the talk a couple of weeks ago, which shows that Andrew has obviously got a greater attraction than I have, although I'm not sure he'd agree with that. Uh, my partners in crime tonight are uh, George McFadden, who's doing a lot of the technicalities and is hiding behind the Black Country Society logo, and Andrew Homer, who will be speaking to us in a moment. Um, the rules of the meeting are straightforward, please. If you could keep mute and keep your video off, at least in the first instance, uh, just to um, uh, reduce the bandwidth that we use and hopefully help it stay as stable as possible. Um, there'll be an opportunity for questions at the end, questions and answers. If you have a question at any stage during the talk, could you put the question in the chat function, please? Um, and uh, we'll pick it up. If you want to actually present it yourself, then simply say, we'll present the question yourself and we'll turn you on and show your video to the world. Um, while I talk about the chat function, it would be nice, we did this last time, if you could all experiment with the chat function and put in uh, where, you talk, where you're actually from, uh, see how far afield we are. In terms of the three speakers, I'm sitting in my house in Litchfield, so I'm not a million miles away from the black country. Um, George is in Great Wiley, um, and we just had someone from Rochester in Kent. Uh, Andrew, our speaker, is from Devon. Uh, Willenhall, King Swinford, Redditch, snowy Redditch, snowy Litchfield indeed. Uh, Gloucester, Holly Hall, Starbridge. Um, Cookley, um, Petmore, if you're running out there, there might be others, um, but we'll, you, you should all see them as they come up anyway. Um, Truro, even further afield than Andrew. Oh, uh, oh they're coming very quickly now. Um, Chippenham in Wiltshire, um, Sturchley. Anyway, uh, we'll see them. We'll see them carrying on coming. Um, I'd like to introduce you, as you're looking at that, to our speaker Andrew, the convener, uh, co-convener of the group. Really, uh, Andrew had a career as a college lecturer, uh, and he spent a few years working in the charity sector after that, before taking early retirement, or as he says, so he thought. While he was studying him for a master's degree in West Midlands history at the University of Birmingham, uh, simply out of personal interest, he was offered a job as a historic character at the Black Country Living Museum as a new career in costume began, he writes. Um, and he told me in an email earlier today that not that long ago, he'd actually been cast as an elderly Charles Dickens uh, to read parts of A Christmas Carol. Uh, he's now moved to the wilds of Devon, and you'll see that has some implications about how we're presenting this evening in a moment. He was secretary of the Black Country Society when he was in the Black Country, 
and he remains on the committee through the magic of Zoom. He's, he's written a number of books on the black country, Shropshire, and unfortunately Birmingham, but we'll forgive him that one. Uh, can I hand over now to Andrew and he'll tell us how we're going to go on. Oh, thanks, thanks very much, Chris, for that. <laughs> um, yeah, this might seem a rather strange way of um, conducting tonight's talk because quite obviously I'm here, I'm live, but, the, but the, the talk won't be. There is a reason for that. Um, we've, as Chris said, we've moved down to the wilds of, uh, of Devon. We're looking for somewhere to purchase, but while we do that, we're in temporary accommodation. And it's temporary accommodation that doesn't have broadband, believe it or not. Um, so you're looking at me through the, uh, the magic of a, a mobile phone hotspot. Um, which is okay for very low level stuff, but when it comes to playing videos back as we're going to be doing tonight um, and using graphics and other things, it, it just won't do it. So we, we had a discussion about it and we decided that the best thing for me to do would be to actually record the talk, even though I'm here, um, and George is very kindly going to play it back on his computer um, but I am here, um, and so I will be able to do my best to answer any questions at the end. Don't claim to be a great expert on, uh, on Mary MacArthur, but I will uh, do my best with any, uh, any questions. We're going to start off with a very short video. It's only about three minutes, um, but I think, I think it's a fantastic video. It's a friend of mine, um, Tracy Forrest. It was shot a few years ago, and Tracy is one of the very, very few lady chain makers. There aren't many chain makers at all, and even fewer of them are, uh, are women. Um, Tracy was, she's moved on from the Black Country Living Museum now, um, but she was a lady chain maker at the museum. And she talks about the history of chain making. It's only three minutes, but she talks about the history of chain making. But she does it from the perspective of having actually done it herself. Um, I had a little go at chain making. I managed to produce three links of chain. And I can assure you that everything Tracy says about chain making is absolutely true. Um, but I'll, I'll leave Tracy to, uh, to explain that. Um, we're very, very grateful to the Black Country Living Museum for allowing us to use what is their video um, for the three minutes and, and also um, some location shots of the museum as well. So we, we, we're very thankful um, to them. I think it's very appropriate that tonight we should be talking about Mary MacArthur and the chain making women of Cradley Heath, because of course it's International Women's Day. And so uh, what better time to, uh, to celebrate the achievements of, of Mary MacArthur and the, uh, the chain making women. So the way it's going to work, I'm gonna hand over to, to George now. He's gonna play the three minute video. Um, there might be a little gap between the video ending and my talk starting. I'm not gonna jump in and say anything. Uh, we'll just let the one lead into the other. So I uh, do, do hope you enjoy it. The lady chain makers of a hundred years ago, um, would have had very similar conditions to what we're working in here. They were expected to forge about two yards of chain an hour. That's a lot more than what we can do now. And they would have been in the workshop from very small children. So they were learning that process right through from a very young age. I think the youngest is four or five and they were literally working in a chain shop. So a very different life to kids today. It's, it's a big part of uh, the black country heritage. There are very few women chain makers in the country today and we are keeping that tradition alive, passing it on to the future generations. Because we've never forged links before, we've obviously had to learn how to get used to the heat of the fire, but also getting used to forging, holding the tools, holding the hammer, um, knowing what bits of the metal to, to cut off, um, how long the metal needs to be. The thing that I found probably most difficult is the conditions. It is difficult and you can see from the workshop behind me the sort of conditions that the lady chain makers would have been working in. Women chain makers in the past would have been bringing up their families as well. So you'd have had little children running around in the, in the workshop. So the conditions we've been working in, 
it's really, really hot by the forge. Um, you, your face burns, your arms burn, you, every every link you hit, you're getting sparks fly at you, you've caught your skin, you know, sparks flying off your skin, so they're burning, and you're constantly breathing in soot and dust and pollution into your lungs. You can see how bad it would have been for the for the women working full time in this environment. I mean, we've been doing six and a half hours a day. Um, they would have been doing 12 hours a day and forging links like we do. It, it really is difficult. I totally, totally respect the ladies that did this for a full time living. I mean, we at the museum we're showing how it was done, but I couldn't make a living at it. Definitely not. It, you know, it's totally, totally different way of life. Um, so if you don't know much about the Lady Chainmakers, come along to the Black Country Living Museum. Uh, you'll see us working the forge um, and how we would have made chain a hundred years ago. Because the processes are exactly the same today as what they were then. Uh, you'll see the workshop which we're working in, but it was also where we'd have brought up our children. So you would, you'll see the sorts of conditions that they would also be brought up in. Um, you'll see working class family homes as well, you know, how we would have lived and worked in the forges here at the museum. Black Country Living Museum in Dudley houses buildings moved from around our region. The museum tells the stories not only of the buildings themselves, but also the lives of the people who were connected with them. One of the most substantial buildings to be moved to the museum is the Workers' Institute, originally built at Cradley Heath in 1912. In 2004, this historic building was under threat of demolition to make way for a bypass and a new Tesco superstore. Fortunately, it was saved, partly due to a substantial grant by the Heritage Lottery Fund, and it was moved, brick by brick, to the museum's 26-acre site. This particular building was saved because it is the last tangible reminder of a remarkable event that took place in 1910 when the women chainmakers of Cradley Heath downed their hammers and went on strike, led by their charismatic leader, Mary Reed MacArthur. Although the strike was local to Cradley Heath, it served to focus the world's attention on the so-called sweated industries. These sweated industries were typified by very low pay, very poor working conditions and very long hours. The area around Cradley Heath was a major centre for chain and anchor making. The chain trade involved both men and women. The men were mainly involved in producing heavy chain in the many chain making works. The area was particularly well known for the production of high quality cable chain used for ship's anchors. This special type of chain had a stud or a pin to prevent fouling and to increase strength as can be seen here. It's well known that the chains and anchors for the Titanic and her sister ships were made at Noah Hingley's in Netherton. The massive centre anchor is seen here being drawn by eight of Hingley's horses. Not twenty, as in the now famous picture, but that's another story. Women, on the other hand, often worked in backyard chain shops producing small chain. This was known as hand hammered or country work chain due to its extensive use in agriculture. The army also used vast amounts of this small chain at a time when horses were still the main motive power. The woman working here is producing country work chain and the process can be seen quite clearly. Up against the left hand wall can be seen the rods of iron which would have been delivered by a middleman known as the fogger. The lady is hand hammering country work chain which can be seen piling up on the floor. 
the fogger would collect this chain and pay the going rate, which equated to a penny farthing an hour for a skilled worker. The conditions these women were forced to work in were simply appalling. With no proper childcare, it was common for babies and children up to the age of five to be in the chain shops amongst the heat and sparks with their mothers. A little lad can be seen here in the chain shop to the right of the open door. From the age of five though in 1910, children would have been in school. In 1898, Robert Sherrard wrote a book called The White Slaves of England, where he graphically described the squalor and conditions in the sweated industries, including the nail and chain trades in the black country. He visited a place called Anvil Yard in Cradley Heath and produced some vivid descriptions of the conditions he found there. One may come across sheds with five or six women each working at her anvil, that are all talking above the din of their hammers and the clanking of their chains, or they may be singing a discordant chorus. And at first, the sight of this sociability makes one overlook the misery, which, however, is only too visible. Be it in the foul rags and preposterous boots that the women wear, or in their haggard faces, and the faces of wizened infants, hanging to their mother's breasts as these ply the hammer or sprawling in the mire on the floor amidst the showers of fiery sparks. He also noted that in a shed fitted with forge and anvil there was a woman at work. From a pole which ran across the room there dangled a tiny swing chair for the baby so whilst working her hammers the mother could rock the child. The late Ron Moss was a prominent member of the Black Country Society and a recognised expert on chain and anchor making. Ron recalled that the son of a backyard chain maker told him that his mother had made chains from 6am till 6pm, then crossed the yard into her house and with the help of the local midwife gave birth. She then returned to her forge and continued working until 10 p.m. Although the chain making women's strike was basically about pay, it was to have far reaching consequences for all workers in the sweated industries. I'm referring to it as a strike, but back in 1910 it was a lockout. This is not really a good descriptor though, because of course the women were working from home in domestic chain shops and not actually locked out of anywhere. The strike was not simply about the women wanting more money. In fact, they were fighting for something they were fully entitled to. To discover the reasons for the strike and Mary MacArthur's involvement, we need to go back to the events of 1906, which proved to be a very busy year for the young Mary MacArthur, who was still only 26 years of age. The starting point was an exhibition in 1906 financed by George Cadbury from nearby Bourneville through his newspaper, The Daily News. The exhibition focused attention on workers in the sweated industries and was instrumental in creating a pressure group called the Anti-Sweating League in the same year. This was set up to put pressure on the Liberal government of the time to finally do something about the sweated industries and introduce a minimum wage. As well as George Cadbury, other influential members included historian R. H. Tawney, J. J. Mallon, who was the secretary, and Mary MacArthur. Mary MacArthur was born in Glasgow, and when she left school, she went to work for her father as bookkeeper in his draper's shop. Mary's ambition, though, was to be a journalist, and to this end, she would travel around various meetings in Glasgow and write them up for a local newspaper. One of these happened to be a meeting of the air branch of the Shop Assistance Union. Once she'd been exposed to the ideas of trade unionism and socialism, Mary knew exactly what she wanted to do with her life. She went to work for the Shop Assistance Union and was quickly made secretary of the air branch. 
but by 1903 she'd been invited by Gertrude Tuckwell, president of the Women's Trade Union League, to join the WTUL as secretary. Here she was given the brief of forming a National Federation of Women Workers, the NFWW, which she did in 1906. The Federation was effectively a general national union for women in different industries, including, importantly, the hand-hammered chain branch. The emblem of the National Federation of Women Workers appeared on both enamel badges and marching banners. The symbolism very effectively represents the aims of the NFWW. The clasped hands are a common trade union motif and here the hand on the left clearly belongs to a woman with a lace sleeve whilst the hand on the right belongs to a man. This represented the Federation's aim of unity between female and male trade unionists. This aim was eventually realised in 1921 when the NFWW merged with the National Union of General Workers. The motto, to fight, to struggle, to right the wrong, is taken from Tennyson's poem Wages and represents not just the fight for fair wages but also the poet's stance on equality for men and women. The bundle of sticks running down the centre of the emblem has its origins in the Roman fasces, a symbol of power. However, Mary MacArthur often used the analogy of a bundle of sticks to represent the strength of the union. Writing in the NFWW magazine The Woman Worker in September 1907, which Mary herself edited, she stated that a trade union is like a bundle of sticks. The workers are bound together and have the strength of unity. No employer can do as he likes with them. They have the power of resistance. They can resist reductions in wages. They can ask for an advance without fear. A worker who is not in a union is like a single stick. She can easily be broken or bent to the will of her employer. She has not power to resist a reduction in wages. If she's fined, she must pay without complaint. She dare not ask for a rise. If she does, she will be told, if you do not like it, you can leave it. She will be told, your place is outside the gate. There are plenty to take your place. An employer can do without one worker. He cannot do without all his workers. Following an impassioned testimony by Mary MacArthur to the Parliamentary Subcommittee on Home Working, the Liberal Government passed the Trade Boards Act in 1909. It was Winston Churchill who introduced and guided the Act through Parliament as President of the Board of Trade back in his Liberal days. Initially, four boards were set up, these being to cover chain making, cardboard box making, clothing and lace making the first of which was the Chain Trade Board. In 1910, this was successful in bringing in a minimum wage of twopence halfpenny an hour for chain makers who were mainly working from home in small chain shops and were being paid on piecework rates of approximately a penny farthing an hour. As it was piecework and not a fixed wage, the women were only paid for what they made. The very minimum rate in the hand-hammered chain trade set by the Trade Boards Act was twopence halfpenny an hour for chain with links up to 11 30 seconds diameter. For any larger hand-hammered chain, the minimum rate was to be three and a third pence per hour. The Act did not cover factory chain makers, who had been organised into trade unions for some time and were better paid. It was only those employed on piecework rates in making hand-hammered and dollied chain in small workshops and domestic forges. These were mainly women working up to 55 hours a week and earning between 4 and 5 shillings. It wasn't very much, but it was still essential money for very poor and often very large families. 
Chain Trade Board was made up of workers' representatives, including Mary MacArthur, and employers' representatives, who were mainly members of the Chain Manufacturers Association, the CMA. Agreement on a minimum wage was difficult to reach, as the CMA wanted to protect profits at all costs. Eventually, agreement was reached in March 1910 at Tuppence Hapney an Hour doubling the pay of the poorest women chainmakers. But agreement didn't come without caveats. Firstly, payment of the minimum wage could be delayed until August 1910. But secondly, and more crucially, a bizarre loophole enabled workers themselves to opt out of the minimum wage for a further six month period. A few chainmaking firms paid the new minimum wage immediately but most did not. Both CMA and non-association companies in Cradley Heath resorted to underhand tactics. Women were tricked or coerced into signing a complex worded document saying they did not want the minimum wage for the six month period running from August. Few of the women could read or write and didn't fully understand what they were signing. Those that could read and understand it were threatened with no further work unless they signed. The chain making companies began stockpiling chain against the time they would have to pay the minimum wage, so the women would have no work. The intention was to challenge the Trade Boards Act and the authority of the Chain Trade Board to impose a minimum wage. They also thought that they could blame the Chain Trade Board and discredit it for effectively making the women redundant. If the first of the trade boards had failed, this would have had serious national implications for the whole concept of a minimum wage in the sweated industries. The seriousness of the situation did not go unnoticed by Mary MacArthur, who made her way by train to Cradley Heath. This was not, though, the first time she'd set foot in the Black Country. Describing her first visit to Cradley Heath, she wrote, The red glow of the forge fires and the dim shadows of the chain makers made me think of some torture chamber of the Middle Ages. At this time, Cradley Heath alone was recorded as having nearly a thousand small chain shops where hand hammered chain was made. Now there's only one in situ and still operating, albeit for demonstrations only. This is Mushroom Green Chain Shop, which was saved largely due to Ron Moss and the efforts of the Black Country Society in the 1970s. It is now looked after by Industrial Heritage Stronghold, who provide free chain making demonstrations in the afternoons on the second Sunday of every month between April and October. Chain can be seen being made by hand using traditional tools and methods, and in the same sort of conditions Many women chainmakers would have spent their entire working lives. The very last of the women chainmakers was Lucy Woodall, who was born in 1899. Ron Moss took this picture of Lucy making chain at Woodhouses. Although she didn't take part in the strike because she was too young, she clearly recalled the historic events of 1910 in Rob Woolley's Geats or Mama. I can still picture them in my mind, the women coming up Cradley Heath. I was about ten and wasn't yet at work. There was uproar. It was when MacArthur came and they did carry on. Lucy started work herself, aged just thirteen, earning four shillings a week. She retired in 1969, but loved chain making so much she soon returned part time. Finally, in 1973, arthritis meant she had to finally down her tools. She became quite a celebrity, with radio and TV appearances, together with articles about her life appearing in print. Despite the sheer hard physical work involved in producing Hand Hammered Chain, Lucy took great pride in her work and found it difficult to retire from. Very similar to Chainmaker Patience Round, who we will meet later. Lucy was made an honorary vice president of the Black Country Society 
and is seen here accepting the honour from our first president, Dr John Fletcher. Lucy Woodall passed away in 1979, just shy of her 80th birthday. She was a lovely lady, and it was a privilege to have met her on several occasions. But back to the strike. Mary tried her best to negotiate an acceptable settlement with the CMA, but to no avail. The new rate was due to be paid from August the 17th. But in the event, few employers complied with the Chain Trade Board minimum wage. The situation escalated quickly. A meeting of 400 women at Granger's Lane School on August the 21st effectively marked the start of what was to be a nearly 10-week lockout, when they all agreed not to sign the opting out document. Things came to a head on the 23rd of August 1910, when the NFWW insisted, through a new agreement, that the minimum wage should be paid straight away. This resulted in the chain-making companies withdrawing raw materials and effectively putting the women out of work. Strike was now inevitable. The authority of the trade boards to address the plight of workers in the sweated industries nationally was now to be tested in Cradley Heath. It was an incredibly brave thing for these women to down their tools and go on strike. Although the women didn't earn very much, the money was essential for their families. To put it in some sort of context, the four or five shillings a week they could earn would just about cover the rent on the substandard cottages and workshops where they were living and working. Secondly, having put down their hammers, there was every chance that they might never work again. The one thing that made it possible for so many to down tools, and it was around 800 women at the height of the strike, was the provision of a strike fund. The problem was, when Mary MacArthur made the promise of a strike fund, she didn't really know where the money was coming from. But if Mary made a promise, she kept it. The women trusted her, and they were quite right to do so, because the national publicity campaign orchestrated by Mary MacArthur was nothing short of phenomenal. She used all of the available media which frankly wasn't much in 1910, to raise money for the strike fund. Mary also addressed meetings all over the country to tell as many people as possible about the stand being made by the Cradley Heath women chain makers. Thanks largely to Mary's sterling efforts, money for the strike fund began to pour in from near and far. Equally enthusiastic local organisation in Cradley Heath was provided by Julia Varley, Charles Sitch and his father, Thomas Sitch. Thanks mainly to the efforts of Julia Varley some years earlier, many women belong to the NFWW. If you have any interest in women's trade unionism at this time, Julia Varley is a fascinating character. An uneducated Bradford Mill girl, from an early age she rose right through the ranks of women's trade unionism to eventually serve on the TUC General Council and was eventually awarded an OBE for her trade union work. At the time of the strike, Charles Sitch was the local secretary of the Hand Hammered Chain branch of the NFWW. Together with his father, Thomas Sitch, Secretary of the Chainmakers and Strikers Association, which was the men's union, the three of them would take on the organisation of the strike locally. Mary had skilfully garnered the support of regional and national newspapers, including the Times, to publicise the strike. She well knew the power of evocative images, and to this end she had professional photographs taken which were publicised in newspapers across the land. This is one of those pictures. Mary had a group of the oldest lady chain makers she could find photographed in their Sunday best with some of them wearing chains around their necks. Pictures such as these appeared in the press together with headlines such as Fetters of Fate and 
women slaves of the forge. This was a clever move by Mary to deliberately make a connection between these women and slavery. This was not the first time such a connection had been made, as with Robert Sherrod's White Slaves of England. The oldest woman on strike was Patience Round, who was 79 in 1910 and still a full-time chainmaker, who incredibly lived to be 103. Her banner reads, England's disgrace, locked out after 67 years chain making, fight for tuppence halfpenny per hour. Patients liked to talk about her life and her story appeared in the newspapers of the day. In fact, she turned out to be an unexpected star of the strike. She's the only one of the striking women that we really know much about. Her father was a chain maker. Her second husband was Thomas Round, born in Mushroom Green, a miner who later became a block chain maker. Thomas was stepfather to Patience's four children, Elizabeth, Mary Ann, Darins and Alice. Elizabeth and Mary both became chain makers and Alice married a well-known local chain maker, James Joseph Tibbets. Patience made chain as an outworker for both Woodhouses and Hingleys. The London-based Daily Express newspaper at the time reported that her life is wrapped up in the making of chains and she will talk for hours of the sparks and the wonderful chains she has made during her career. The reporter wrote, I found her standing beside her forge where the white ashes on the stone floor showed signs of recent work before the strike. She was full of excitement, for she had just returned from a strike meeting held a mile from the chain-making village. The very fact of the place of meeting being so far away was of great moment to Mrs Round, who has never in her life stepped across the outskirts of Cradley Heath. Birmingham, which is 10 miles away, is as a foreign town to the old woman of the forge. These are wonderful times, she said. I never thought that I should live to assert the rights of us women. It has been the week of my life. Three meetings and such beautiful talking. The report also stated that a total of 12 striking women were 70 years of age or older. Patience was a woman of great stamina. As a 100th birthday treat in 1931, Patience was driven around Cradley Heath in a horse-drawn open landau. She was quite the celebrity after the strike and most people in the district knew her. She was heartily cheered as she passed by. She died at the age of 103. It was said of Patience that she was small in stature but had the heart of a lion. It was in 1910 that French filmmaker Charles Pathé came to England to introduce his Pathé newsreel service to British cinema audiences. Mary convinced him to come and film a march in Cradley Heath. Not only that, the film included the conditions the women were working and living in. Although silent, the film was shown in up to 600 theatres all over the country. The film would have been shown in silent cinemas similar to this one at the Black Country Living Museum. Even the local children got involved in their own way. People stepping off the train were greeted with, Give me a nod, missus. The children collected nods for good luck and marked a cross on a piece of paper for each one. When they'd collected a hundred, the paper was buried for two days, then dug up, soaked in water for a day, and then burnt on a forge. At this point they made a wish for a positive outcome to the strike, which they firmly believed would come true. Locally there were regular rallies, marches and meetings to keep the impetus of the strike going. This is Mary addressing the crowds in Cradley Heath. 
It's interesting to note the number of men in the crowd as well as women. Thomas Sitch, of course, one of the local leaders of the women's strike, was secretary of the Chainmakers and Strikers Association, the Men's Union. Mary MacArthur's biographer, Mary Agnes Hamilton, provided a description of these marches and rallies. Day by day, night by night, there were processions with hammers and torches, bands and collectors of pennies. The women even had their own marching song, Rousey Women, sung to the tune of Men of Harlech. This copy is from the University of Warwick collection. I'm not going to attempt to sing it, but the first verse neatly sums up the spirit of the chain-making women's strike. Rouse ye women long enduring, beat no iron, blow no bellows, till ye win the fight ensuring, pay that is your due. Mary also undertook a national lecture tour to expose the chain-making companies not paying the minimum wage as supporters of sweated labour. The result of all these publicity efforts was that money poured into the strike fund. There were collections on street corners and in factories, poorer people contributed pennies and halfpennies, and even the aristocracy and leading business families got involved. Julia Varley remembered knocking on a door during a street collection and realising that the old woman who answered was clearly poverty-stricken herself. Even so, on realising Julia was collecting for the chain-making women, she said, I must do what I can to help those poor women. I will give you what I have, though it is only a halfpenny." So much money was being collected for the strike fund that even chain-making women who could not afford the threepence a week union dues were promised strike pay if they downed tools and joined the strike. It should be remembered that threepence could buy a loaf of bread and that might result in someone not eating for a large family. At its height, about 800 women were actively striking. The strike fund was distributed on a weekly basis. As it grew, it was possible to pay union members six shillings a week, and non-union members got four shillings. When the weekly distribution started, women with babies were allowed to the front of the queue as a convenience for them. However, it was soon found that the same babies kept reappearing as they were being lent out by friends and neighbours to enable women to jump the queue. Mary MacArthur also successfully convinced members of the aristocracy and prominent families to donate funds. Amongst many others, the Countess of Beauchamp sent a cheque for £100. The Countess of Warwick sent £25 with the promise of more if needed. And Arthur Chamberlain, of the influential Birmingham-based Chamberlain family, contributed 50 guineas. Also in Birmingham, George Cadbury, of the Bourneville Quaker Cadbury family, made regular contributions of £10. Quite a considerable amount in 1910. A record held by the University of Warwick shows that George Cadbury had made two weekly contributions of £10 in September 1910, together with other significant contributions from various organisations. Over the ten weeks of the strike, it was hoped to raise £1,000. In the event, nearly £4,000 was raised, a very considerable amount of money in 1910. A number of factors contributed to ending the strike in the women's favour. The chain-making companies involved had seriously underestimated the strength of feeling against them due mainly to Mary MacArthur's incredible publicity campaign. This was bad for business. They had also been shown to be the villains of the peace, and in this case clearly they were. What really settled it in the women's favour though happened at national level. The government, who of course had brought in the minimum wage to the Chain Trade Board, were persuaded that they shouldn't really be placing any more contracts for chain with companies not paying the government's own minimum wage. The Liberal government agreed. 
this was a very serious issue for the CMA, as such contracts, particularly for the Army and Navy, were extremely lucrative. Checkmate. On the 2nd of September 1910, CMA member companies added their names to a list maintained by the Chain Trade Board. This was known as the White List and contained the names of companies paying the legal minimum wage. This was subject to an agreement that Mary and the NFWW would continue to pay women working for non-CMA companies who were still refusing to pay the minimum wage. The CMA feared unfair competition. Also, it didn't stop CMA members from using foggers who were still paying the old rates. Even so, it was a major turning point, but was by no means the end of the strike. On the 3rd of September, a massed march made its way from Cradley Heath to Old Hill, complete with NFWW banners and a marching band. Further women joined the strike, taking the total to about 800. However, Trinder and Company capitulated quickly on the 6th of September and 120 of the women returned to work. Meanwhile, Julia Varley was successful in gaining the full support of the TUC for the strike. Now it was only a matter of time before the women won. Between a march on the 3rd of October and a final meeting on the 19th, the CMA agreed to only use foggers who paid the new rates and the names on the whitelist continued to grow. On the 22nd of October 1910, the very last company added their name to the whitelist and the strike was officially over. The strike had lasted 10 weeks and through the efforts of Mary MacArthur had drawn attention to the plight of not just the chain-making women of Cradley Heath but to the whole issue of sweated labour. The chain-making women of Cradley Heath had won their minimum wage of twopence halfpenny an hour, thanks mainly to Mary MacArthur and her unwavering belief in the justice of the cause. Out of the near £4,000 raised for the strike fund, there was nearly £1,500 left in it when the strike ended. Mary MacArthur could have put that money into NFWW coffers. It was, after all, an NFWW strike. But she didn't. Mary proposed that the money be used for the construction of the Workers' Institute I mentioned right at the start. She also stipulated that it should be open to everyone, not just chain makers, but for all workers and families of Cradley Heath. It was to be both, quote, a centre of social and industrial activity in the district. It was originally built on some wasteland in Lomi Town, Cradley Heath, where some of the strike rallies had taken place. It was entirely appropriate that it should be opened by a woman, and indeed it was. The Countess of Dudley came over from her home at Whitley Court in Worcestershire and opened the Cradley Heath Workers' Institute on June the 10th, 1912. Lady Dudley told the assembled crowd that she and the second Earl had been in Australia at the time as he was the Governor General, but news of the lockdown had reached them there and she emphasised the support even from the other side of the world. She then proceeded to officially open the Workers' Institute using a key presented to her by the architect, Albert Thomas Butler. This had been A.T. Butler's first major building commission at the start of what would be a distinguished career. He designed a wonderful later arts and crafts style building reminiscent of Scottish architect Charles René Mackintosh in a geometric style with decorative brick and tile work. I'm sure visitors must wonder about the bundles of sticks either side of the name until they discover the history of the building and its connection with women's trade unionism. It really comes to life when there is live music being played to packed audiences during special events such as the Forces weekends. As a little aside, when I worked at the museum, 
one of my jobs was to give an advertised talk on the building and its history. On one occasion, I was working in Morrill's The Gentleman's Outfitters when a colleague came in. He was due to do the talk and guided tour that day, but knowing my interest, offered to swap and look after the shop. The reason was that A.T. Butler's granddaughter was visiting specifically to see the building. She was a lovely retired lady, and in chatting to her afterwards, she was able to answer a question that had long puzzled me. The contract for the design of the Stoot, as it's known locally, had been put out to tender. And it was A.T. Butler's first major building, and yet he beat much more established architects to win the contract. It turned out, according to his granddaughter, that the family at the time had close connections with chain making in Cradley Heath, and this had made him the ideal choice as architect. The Workers' Institute then remains as it was originally intended, a lasting monument to the bravery of those chain making women who downed their tools in 1910 and to their charismatic leader, Mary Reed MacArthur. The successful conclusion of the strike did not end Mary MacArthur's involvement with the Black Country though. She had been made a trustee of the Workers' Institute, together with JJ Mallon, as you might expect, but she also stood for Stourbridge in the general election of 1918. 1918 was the first time women were allowed to stand for Parliament, and the first time some women got the vote. It was also the first time men over the age of 21 got the vote. Unlike men though, the women had to be over 30 and homeowners or married to homeowners. Not surprisingly, Mary disagreed with this, but it didn't stop her from standing for Parliament. It is hardly surprising that Mary MacArthur would want to enter politics. She was great friends with Keir Hardy, who was a founder of the Labour Party and its first leader. Like Mary, Keir Hardy had been a trade unionist in Scotland, and they had much in common. This is part of Mary MacArthur's election manifesto, which is held in the TUC Library Collection of London Metropolitan University. You can see that she signed it Mary R. MacArthur, but in brackets underneath, Mrs. W. C. Anderson. Mary was married. She had actually met her future husband, William, Will Anderson, at one of the union meetings she'd attended in Glasgow. The young and idealistic Mary, though, had no time for romance, and it wasn't until 1911 that they finally married. Will Anderson was himself a Labour MP for Sheffield Attercliffe between 1914 and 1918, when he lost his seat. Despite being regarded as nothing short of a heroine after the chain-making women's strike, Mary lost the election to the Liberal candidate John Wilson by just 1,333 votes. One of the reasons for this was her name. Unusually for the period, Mary generally went by her maiden name of MacArthur, as can be seen on the manifesto. The returning officer for Stourbridge, though, insisted that she had to be Mrs Anderson on the ballot papers, rather than the name she was well known by. Simply not enough people realised who Mrs Anderson really was. Unfortunately, Mary didn't live to see another general election. Her husband Will Anderson died in 1919 after contracting influenza, which turned to pneumonia. And Mary MacArthur died of stomach cancer in 1921. She was still only 40 years of age when she passed away at her home in London. Had Mary won that election in 1918, she would have been the first lady in this country to take her seat in Parliament, as Nancy Astor wasn't elected until 1919. But for 1,333 votes cast in Stourbridge, the name Mary MacArthur would be very much more widely recognised, and I personally think deservedly so.
Uh, so if Andrew could come back and in live, so to speak, so we can see his face again, and George can do his magic with the highlighting so uh, the two of us can be seen. Uh, I've got some questions already in chat that I'll put to Andrew. Uh, and please, if you've got any more, uh, put them there. As I say, if you actually'd like to put the questions yourself, then indicate that in your in the chat, and I'll make sure that uh, you're called upon uh, called upon appropriately. Um, so the first one, Andrew, is is really about the limits of Cradley Heath. Uh, how far does it reach? Did it include Old Hill? I guess there's a wider question there about where was the chain making exactly? Where, the, how far did it extend? Yeah, the, the main chain making areas were, were uh, Cradley Heath, uh, Old Hill uh, and Neverton. And in fact, it's it's quite interesting that the um, the Old Hill chain making women didn't didn't realise for some reason that that they were eligible for the, the minimum wage and could join the strike um so they they did join it after that march that um, that i mentioned so it's quite interesting that um that they didn't realize Mo i believe most of the women on strike there were um home workers in Craigley heath itself um okay fine uh, that was from susan i don't know susan who uh, the the next question is um is actually from uh, Heather Wasty. Uh, it's about that Pathé News film, which I was going to ask as well. Does it still exist? Uh, it's it, it's been lost, unfortunately, um, which is an incredible shame. Absolutely yeah. incredible. It's it's definitely lost. There's been some serious searches for it, um, and it, it just doesn't exist anymore. Terrible shame because it would have been absolutely fantastic. Um, piece of, uh, of film to see, especially as, as they were filming, um, as I said in the uh, in the recording, not just the march, but they were also filming the conditions that the women were, were living and working in. So yeah. uh, it's an awful shame that, the, that that's lost. Yes, indeed. Um, it, probably, it probably dissolved the, uh, the film that they used in those days, um, unless it's transferred, uh, just, just doesn't preserve. So... So it's uh, very, very unfortunate. Great shame. Uh, there's a question I know I'm pretty sure you can answer because I know you can. Uh, uh, Pam Archer asks, can you rec recommend any further reading for us? And Heather, um, Heather Wast is actually sent a, a reference over, but I know you can say more, Andrew. Yes, I've, I've, I've done a list, um, which uh, I didn't want to put on the end of the video because it'd be difficult to... Uh, to copy down um, a fairly comprehensive list. Somebody I, I noticed um, the name um, of Kathy Hunt come up. Um, Kathy Hunt's book is on the list. If you're interested in Mary MacArthur, Kathy Hunt's book, um, Writing the Wrong, Mary MacArthur, 1880 to 18, uh, 1921 is, uh, is the book to get. Um, I've, I've got quite a few references. If, if anybody wants them quickly, um, I'm quite happy for people to email me. Uh, I, I mean, I, so I, I wouldn't worry over much. Uh, once a recording goes on the web, which I hope will be sometime in the next day or two, it will go onto a page where that where your list of references will be there as well. Oh, right. So right. folks will be able, so should be able to get it. Excellent. Uh, then, oh, then a couple, of, comment, you, well, couple just, of comments. Just one, just one quick thing on the on the list, Chris. Um, when, when you look at the list, you'll see there's a, a link to um, a PDF, uh, Chainmakers Strike PDF download. Um, that is an absolutely fantastic resource, covers the chain, in, chain making strike in great detail. It was done in conjunction with, um, I think, the NEU and the Black Country Living Museum. It was originally printed as a, as a colour book, full colour book, and PDF obviously is in full colour, but it is completely free download. So um, that that's certainly worth getting. Sorry, Chris, I've jumped it's okay, in there. It's okay. Uh, a couple of comments uh, from Mike Davis. What a brilliant, fascinating talk. More, please. Do it again, Andrew. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, um, and they carry on from Emma Pursehouse, a magazine editor. That was brilliant. What an excellent talk. Uh, fantastic talk, Andrew from Jack, Jack Price. You've obviously primed the committee members very well here, Andrew. <laughs> uh, Leslie and Mike say, 
Annie Murray's Black Country Orphan is a fictional account of the women chainmakers and includes um, oh, and, and there are there are a number of other number of other books there as well um, listed. I, I might try and take off some of these off the chat function. And yes, you could, add, well. you could add them into the list, Chris, couldn't you put them on the list? Yeah, sure. Um, so there, there's lots of books that folk can put there. And then uh, from Jenny Walker, my grandmother was a home chain maker in Old Hill after being widowed in 1918. She specialised in link chain. Uh, my father recalls. Hold on, sorry. Um, my father recalls from the age of six or seven fetching the raw materials and in turning chain to the middlemen. Uh, yeah. And that's sorry, I'm struggling to flick down on the chat. Bendy Price of Bowling Green Road. I wish I'd asked more now. Yeah, don't we yeah, all? Don't, don't we all? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, but that sort of ties in what you were saying. Uh, Heather again. Oh, no, gives another another book. The Weaver's Daughter is good too. Um, and I think I've come to a, a, an end list to the end of comments. Uh, George, are you able to copy the chat in any way? Um, talking to. Yes, okay. I'll be able to copy the chat if needed. Yes. Uh, the message I've put there is a list of all the books from Andrew from his document. Oh, OK, fine. So that folk will have that anyway. Um, another question. Um, has anyone made or access the list of some of the women chain makers? Uh, um, have they been catalogued at all, Andrew, do you know? I, I don't know that they have. And um, I don't know that there's very much a Apart from patients round who got reported in the in the newspapers, we don't. I don't think we know very much about any of the others. I mean, obviously, we'd be very interested in uh, in finding out if anybody has got the information on um, the individual chain making women who are on strike. But I, I'm I'm not a, I'm not certainly not aware of um, of a list. No, unfortunately. Right. There's a last chance if folk want to put any question there or to say anything. Uh, I'm going to. Uh, it, it's worth saying I've uh, I've added the ability for anyone to unmute themselves if they would like to ask a question that way. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, George. Uh, Martin Rushton asks, when talking about the poor working conditions, how do they compare to other workers at the time? I've done some reading on miners and have read a little on the iron and steel trades. I suspect the women were not worse than some others at the time. Did you get the comment, Andrew? That, that's right. Um, Sherard's book is very good. It's freely available um, on the internet. Um, and that covers the whole raft of sweated industries. Um, the chain making women, it, it was only one. Um, and that's why the, the whole thing was so important, because the chain trade board was, was the first board set up. And if that had gone under, and there was every chance that it might, if the chain making women had not made their stand, then that, that would have meant then that there probably wouldn't have been minimum wages and things done about the other sweated industries. Yeah, I mean, different parts of the country um, had different different sweated industries. Um, the mill workers up, up north, absolutely terrible. You know, working conditions were terrible, I think, all over the country. Um, they'll say specific areas would have their, uh, their specific things, like Crater Heath, Netherton Old Hill, chain making mining of course all across the uh, the back country um mm. yeah so but I, I can recommend sherrard's book it's 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 free because it's public it was published 1898 so um google i think i've just just done a, a copy of it and uh, and yeah. put it on the internet but it's, it's interesting because it i think i said it does cover uh, as far as the back country is concerned nail making which is another fine fine wrong word uh, uh, sweated industry um, and chain making but it also covers um, other other industries as well in in other um, parts of the back country so uh, well worth a look and, and won't cost anything to uh, to do it uh, comment from Pam Archer I'd like to add my thanks too that was brilliant uh, Edward Jones uh, said something just decades what you just said uh, home home based nail makers had similar experiences, um, and then uh, someone writes uh, now if I can find out 
name here, Sharon Cartwright, who I've been in correspondence with, uh, who writes, my great great grandmother was patient ra patience round. Oh. Unfortunately, my family didn't tell me anything about her other than her hundredth oh. birthday. Oh. So I hope, Sharon, you've learned something today. Um, yeah, she was. She uh, was quite. She was a star of the uh, of the strike. Um, was patience. Um, <laughs> Uh, somebody, mentioned, somebody, again, somebody again. mentioned the nail makers. Um, if anything, nail makers are treated worse than the, than the chain makers. Um, earlier on, though, uh, we're talking a few decades before, nail makers were, were treated absolutely appallingly. Um, but, I mean, that's a whole other story. Heather again writes, I'm from Cradle East and have lots of chain makers on my family tree and ancestry listed on the censuses. Thank you so much for a very interesting talk and answers. Oh, thank you. <laughs> okay, and can I add my thanks, Andrew? That was very, very good, brilliant, and I'm glad we didn't experience any technical difficulties. We, we were all a bit worried at the start of that because we didn't quite know how it was all going to work out, whether the videos were going to show properly or whatever. So thank you to everybody. And can I just say, uh, there's one new message, but I'll come to it in a minute. Um, in what's going to happen next? Uh, we're trying the various capabilities of Zoom in different ways in this experimental period. And I'm going to be writing to you all in the next day or two, and anyone who's come, uh, just to say in more detail what we're doing next time, which is April the 19th after Easter. Um, what we're, what I'm, we're proposing is that people, anybody, uh, can write in with a memory that might be a memory of theirs, a memory of their grandmothers, a very old photograph. It might be something they want to read. It might be a poem, whatever. Use your imagination and they can then present it themselves. And I'm looking to get, say, 10 people, something like that, to talk about their old black country memories uh, to the rest of us. I don't know whether it will work. I don't know anyone who want to do that, but it seems worth an experiment. And then the May uh, presentation will be a more standard talk given by Jack Price, one of our committee members and membership secretary, who will be talking about Francis Brett Young. Um, and then Janet Hughes says, I live in the house, which is the home of Mr. Stitch and was the office of the Chainmakers Union. Ah. Uh, right. Um, I wonder if Andrew might quite like some photographs of that house, if you've got, if there are any original bits are remaining. <laughs> yeah, I'd love, I'd love one if there's any original uh, original parts left. It was it was uh, quite a chap, um, Thomas Sitch. There's uh, I, I, it's it's too long to tell it now, and it's too short for a, a fifty minute talk. But Thomas Sitch was involved in a uh, a really uh, interesting story of uh, black country chain makers getting kidnapped by the Germans before the First World War. Um, but it's not a long one. I mean, I possibly I could present that, Chris, as, as my thing you can do it for the, one of your the next time. Minutes, you? Yeah, because it's not that it's not that long, but it's uh, it's quite yeah. interesting. Yeah. But as I say, I will um, write around about that and I'll publicise it in the normal way. Thank you very much, all of you, for uh, connecting tonight, and I hope you all enjoyed it because I certainly did.